Today's episode is sponsored by Hegarty. The Hegarty curricula has 35 weeks of phonological and phonemic awareness lesson plans aligned to the science of reading. Systematic daily lessons require minimal teacher prep time and take just 10 to 12 minutes to complete. The Hegarty curricula is available in both English and Spanish and is being used by thousands of school districts across the United States, Canada, and Australia. Learn more about the curricula, their intervention books, and decodable readers at hegarty.org. That's H-E-G-G-E-R-T-Y dot org. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Teaching, Reading, and Learning, the TRL podcast. I'm your host, Laura Stewart, and I am delighted to welcome Rupin Fufario to our podcast today. I met Rupin when I was in North Carolina for an educational event, and I have been following his work ever since. It is a true joy to welcome him so you can learn about his background, his passions, and his work on behalf of teachers, students, and families. So I'll read his biography to you as a way of introduction. Rupin Fofario is a storyteller at ednc.org, where he examines how education policy shows up in classrooms and impacts teachers, students, and families. Rupin has invested much of his time since 2019 reporting stories about literacy instruction in North Carolina. His stories about the body of research on how kids learn to read take readers inside classrooms, advance student and family narratives, explore challenges for early reading teachers, and study best practices in colleges of education. Prior to joining EdNC, Rubin was an attorney in Raleigh and Chicago, practicing startup and intellectual property law. And in his younger days, he was a sports writer for ESPN.com, the Raleigh News and Observer, and the Orlando Sentinel. Rupin's passion is shining light on untold and underreported issues. Today we'll, re- we'll explore some of those untold and underreported issues and we'll focus in on Rupin's wonderful storytelling. You're in for a treat. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the podcast, Rupin Fafario. Well, Rupin, I'm delighted to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You bet. So, um, so Rupin, we're going to start with the, the question I ask, I've been asking all the guests recently, which is, what is a quote you live by and return to? So um, I guess throughout the years, probably the, the quote I most come back to is, um, it's a Mahatma Gandhi quote, and it goes, in a gentle way, you can shake up the world. Or I think it's actually in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Um, and I like that. I like the uh, the gentle approach. I I, I prefer to lead with love, um, but I do have, you know, just a slight uh, mischievous streak. And so I like the ideas, the idea of shaking things up too. And um, yeah, I I don't really subscribe, you know, to a lot of black and white or right and wrong. Um, and so it's not necessarily, you know, shaking up things that I don't agree with. It's more, you know, um, shaking up conversation to make sure that we're exploring the whole picture, um, that we're, we're, we're considerate of different lived experiences. Uh, to me, that's, that's really the, the, the rattle that I like to give uh, to, to the collective discourse. Oh, I love that. And, you know, just knowing the, your work as I do, I, I see that, that gentle hand in there, and I greatly appreciate that. I really do. There's there's a second quote actually um, that, I, that I come back to a lot, and it's a Tupac quote. It's from Tupac Shakur, and um, it goes something like, "Out of anger comes controversy. Out of controversy comes uh, conversation, and out of conversation comes action." And and I love that one too because it really does guide a, a lot of you know, the service approach in my writing where, you know, I like to, to try to process things before anger swells. Uh, but fear and anger 
are, are natural parts of, of life and I think um, inevitable. But what I love about the quote is the progression, the productive progression um, to conversation and then to action, because I think you need both. Yes, that's I love that. Um, out of anger comes controversy, out of controversy comes conversation, out of conversation comes action. That's really nice. Because doesn't it feel like that? I mean, with, with, with science of reading alone, uh, there, there, there felt like there was a time, and, and still sometimes now, but, but certainly a lot more, you know, a few years ago, I, I felt a lot more anger in the discourse and really controversy. Um, but in North Carolina, it did feel like it just continued to progress and and it, it did ignite conversation and from conversation we did get to action and uh still lots of action ahead but. yeah that's that's really I, I i see that too i actually do i see um what i hope is a lessening of the you know kind of this sort of you know dichotomous thinking and more of a of a relaxation into the okay this is what we know we can do how do we take steps to do it yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely that's nice absolutely so and i and i i want to get into that even more in terms of what's going on in north carolina but how did you get into journalism because your background's very interesting um you were an attorney you were um you know a sports writer but you've really gotten into you're, you're into journalism and specifically into this arena. Yeah, well, so journalism is uh, I love to tell that story because it is thanks to a teacher. <laughs> it is thanks to a teacher. I wasn't the best student, academically speaking, uh, when I was a kid. I, I have a learning difference and was a kid with with learning differences. Um, but uh, you know, even though I'd been diagnosed, uh, I, I don't know if the word is diagnosed, but the school had evaluated me and had de- made the determination. Uh, but my parents who moved here from India, you know, they weren't, they didn't really understand the education, the U.S. education system, um, learning disabilities uh, carry a lot of stigma, uh, it, you know, culturally. And uh, so they, they really didn't um, take any action on that. And so I was a student with a learning difference who wasn't receiving any supports for it. And, um, and I, I remember, you know, just being confused about why my friends were able to perform in certain ways that I just couldn't. Um, and I remember teachers telling me a lot, you know, you need to work harder. You need to start trying. Uh, and I was, I was too embarrassed, you know, to say that I was working really hard. I was trying really hard. Uh, and so I just sort of suffered in silence uh, until I decided that I wasn't that smart. You know, I, I probably was just not that smart. And I started to check out a little bit at school and became more interested in making people laugh uh, and, and looking for other ways to get attention. Uh, but when I was in high school, toward the end of my freshman year, uh, I had a teacher, Mr. Boggs, and Mr. Boggs, you know, saw through my phony front uh, and, and he asked to speak with me after class. And instead of telling me that I needed to work harder or I needed to try more, he told me that I showed promise as a writer and, um, and that he was that advisor for the high school newspaper. And, uh, and so he asked me to join. And it's, you know, it's incredible to think about now. Uh, that might have been, you know, a small moment in his life. Like how many students must he have touched by naming their talent for them? Um, it's probably, you know, too high a number to count. But for me, that one moment was life altering uh, because I joined the, the paper and I enjoyed it so much. I went to college to pursue a degree in journalism. Um, and I was writing from that moment on. That is a wonderful story for a couple of reasons. I mean, number one, the fact that you had a learning difference and at some point it progressed to the point where you thought to yourself, well, I'm just not smart. And you checked out and, and that, that haven't you heard that story again and again and again? And we, yes. lo- and we lose so many of our kids this way, right? But then you were touched by Mr. Boggs, who helped kind of change the trajectory of your life and helped you make a different choice. Yeah. It's really incredible the power the power of a teacher. Um, you know, 
as a kid, I just assumed that the way that the other kids were doing it was correct. I, I assumed that the way that the teachers were teaching was correct. And so if I can't do it, then there's something wrong with me. I'm incorrect. I right? like there's there's a problem with me. And that's hard. It's just really hard to 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 process that and to to you know respond in a mature manner. I think that I was afraid of being stupid. And so it just made the most sense not to say anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you, Mr. Boggs, right? Thank you, Mr. Boggs. And, and you know, I got to tell you, um, Mr. Boggs was a huge sports fan. And so he had me start out writing sports. And, and, that's, and I loved sports. And so it made a lot of sense. And, and I was convinced from the moment I went to college, I went to the University of Maryland, um, and I knew that I was going to be a sports writer for the rest of my life. That's my that's that's my calling. And um, I had a lot of wonderful opportunities. I, I worked part time at The Washington Post and The Baltimore Sun. Um, and I truly, truly enjoyed my time, my season as a sports writer. Um, but there was just something inside that it wasn't, you know, it really wasn't filling me all the way up. It didn't feel as purposeful for me. And I think that's why. I decided to to take a temporary detour and and pursue the law, um, and I hung in there as long as I could as a lawyer. But um, you know, I think that there I met a lot of wonderful attorneys. Um, I think that there is there can be nobility in the profession, like any profession, it's got uh, uh, some drawbacks. But but it just was not a good fit for me at all. I, I it felt soul sucking at times. Um, and so when I decided that I needed to, to get back to writing, that writing is really what brings me alive and not just writing, but, but writing stories, storytelling is really what brings me to life. Um, and when I made that decision, my kids were 10 and seven. Um, and I just remember looking at their ed education and interacting with their teachers and reflecting on, you know, my own education experiences and I just felt like maybe this is a space where, where I can be of service, you know, to students who are like me, um, to our state, uh, to our future. This is, you know, for Ed NC, this is our, our students, our state, our future. That's our, 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 our students, motto. our state, our future. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I think that you, um, you listened to that in, you know, you listened to that gentle voice to help shape your life and bring you into writing and especially into educational writing. Um, and that seems to be your passion, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I believe in it. And, and you've talked about the power of storytelling. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I just think that, um, you know, we're, we experience life through story. Um, and we're hardwired to do that. I like to say this, like we may not be hardwired to learn how to read, but we are hardwired for story. Um, our survival and, and prosperity as a species has depended upon it. And so when, when I approach storytelling, it is through that lens. It is um, with the idea that, you know, when I experience an event, when something happens, uh, particularly when it is emotional. And so let's say it's a painful event. I, I almost always learn from that. I mean, there is something that happens up here. Uh, what I love about storytelling and telling others stories and even sharing my story with, with others is that it allows us the opportunity without experiencing that pain or that sadness or whatever the emotion is. It allows us the opportunity to learn. Um, you know, I experience it neurologically, almost as if uh, it was happening to me. And so, you know, mentally and physically, I can learn from that story through, through, the, through the experience of story. And so I believe that storytelling is, um, is really, if done responsibly, it is one of, it has the capacity to be one of our greatest acts of service. And, and that's what draws me to it. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, it really, um, through storytelling, we can develop, would you say, empathy with the other? Is that yeah. part of it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to, um, 
that can be the hard part. You know, when I started at, at NC, my very first assignment, so before they even hired me full time, my first assignment was to, uh, it was a freelance gig for, for two or three months. And they sent me out east there. I think it was Hurricane Florence that had just come through. And there was a lot of flooding um, along, the, along the coast and um, schools were shut down. And, and schools ended up closing in various districts uh, for between 25 and 40 days. You know, this was a significant event. And I remember driving in and going through, you know, the, the, the main streets and the, the highways that were leading into these communities. And you would just look on both sides of you, um, just the destruction, you know, houses were gutted. You know, people's possessions, all of their possessions just sitting on the curbside and, and photos, you know, like how treasured those photos must have been. Um, just everything they owned, just on the, 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 the side of the street. And this was my, my reintroduction to, to storytelling. And this was the story that I was going to try to tell. And, you know, when I talk about responsible storytelling, I think it means a lot of things, but but one of them is to convey the responsibility to convey the emotion that the protagonist, you know, the, the subjects of the story are feeling. And I think to do that, you have to feel that, that emotion, you know, you have to lead with empathy and vulnerability. Um, and I, I think that I'm an empathetic person by nature, um, but, but there was a lot of tears, you know, um, it was a, it was definitely a struggle. Is this a, I know there's a little bit of a, of a side question here, but is this a different way of looking at journalism as opposed to the quote unquote objective journalist? Is storytelling a different way to look at journalism? Uh, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I don't consider myself an academic on, on the subject. Um, I will say that personally, I, I look at it as a form of journalism. Um, and so I don't look at what I do so much as news reporting, which is where we start to think of like, you know, a lot of these rules and, and, and rigid adherence to objectivity. And um, I mean, I think those are, are under question anyway, and, and for good reason, because I think that objectivity has been used, um, you know, to, I think they've been used in, in ways that have disadvantaged communities and particularly uh, uh, historically minority communities, whether that be racial minorities or gender minorities. Um, and so, so I've always had a struggle with this, this idea of objectivity. I mean, even dating back to when I was a sports writer, they would say that you can't, have, you can't show any um, attachment to teams. And I was a college reporter attending college at the University of Maryland. And this is when, you know, we've, we had Steve Francis and Juan Dixon and this wonderful team. And it's, it's ludicrous to think that I have no attachment to, to what's happening. Um, and so I always had a, a problem with objectivity. I mean, I think that people want, um, they want, they want a sense of fairness. They want honesty and truth. And I think that those things are absolutely important. Um, but objectivity for the sake of objectivity and objectivity, uh, depending on how it is executed, I, I don't know how it doesn't always it doesn't always serve the reader. Um, with storytelling, I am much more grounded in, in, in searching for truth and experience and really just relaying experience. I, I'm trying not so much to to show two sides of an issue or every side of an issue. It's really like, this is this, the person and this is the story that I'm telling. And I'm gonna do it as you know, forthrightly and, and honestly as I can. And you know, Rupin, I, I love that because I think at the end of the day, that is what touches people's hearts. And, you know, I, I oftentimes think about you know, in, the, in the literacy world and you know, trying to enact change for the betterment of teachers and children. And it's not beating people about the head with facts. It's not about more research. It's about the stories. The stories are what is going to win the day here. Yes. 
I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, when, when I think about Tupac and I think about going from conversation to action, you know, there's something that happens. I think that we get invested um, in each other and we get in, in, invested in people that we choose to help um, and choose to support. Or maybe we get invested in the conversation and in, in the, the people we're, ha- we're in conversation with. But there needs to be something. I mean, at least in my experience, in my life, um, I find that I'm moved to change for uh, just a small number of reasons. And, and probably most, um, most frequently it's out of pain. You know, I'm doing something that isn't quite right. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not serving me well. And after enough pain, I will, I will change. Um, but oftentimes it is because it's out of love, right? It's out of love. And I think that that's what story can do is when you get to know someone through story, um, you, 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 you can open up to loving people. I know you've, uh, you've reported, you've, you've, you have um, told many compelling stories. Um, can you pinpoint a particularly compelling story that you think has really touched both yourself as the writer and those who read your writing? Hmm. So it might be the whole, it might be a whole, you know, compilation of stories as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, it is, it is in in what I've done as far as education reporting, it is the, the compilation of stories around literacy. I mean, there's no question to me about that. Uh, I, I care deeply about covering learning differences and telling those stories. I care deeply about um, not just that, you know, neurodiversity, but also racial diversity and racial equity. I care deeply about those things. Um, And by the way, (laughs) literacy touches on all of those things. Um, But I think that, but the, you know, the, the covering literacy has been um, an incredible experience, just learning. Um, And, and, and it was, uh, it was an emotional experience for me because it's been personal to me from the beginning. And so I think if I chose one, it would be the very first one that I wrote. And it would be that one because I almost didn't write it. I almost never went down this path. Uh, and so I can tell you that story please, if you're please. interested. Yes, yes. I, um, you know, literacy got on my radar. I was hired to cover learning differences. And, and of course, as, as, a, as a person with learning differences, highly invested in that, you know, and remain so today. Um, and as I was going out and doing interviews with families, I was also watching state board meetings um, and, and paying attention to, you know, the, the education news of the day. And I remember uh, looking at literacy, at reading scores in North Carolina. And this wasn't NAEP, this was state scores. And I was looking, I was just astounded at, at the, the low proficiency rates. Um, and I was, you know, disgusted really uh, when I looked at the, nobody d- 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 across any demographic, nobody, there was no six, su- like th- there wasn't great success in teaching any demographic of children h- how, to, how to read skillfully. Um, but then when you look at students of color, there was still this wide gap. And, and I just, you know, I, I felt some kind of way about that. And, and as I was going out and doing interviews with the families of uh, students with learning differences, I was also hearing about literacy issues. You know, the, the, the parents were telling me the same story over and over again and, and, and with equal parts, you know, fear and exasperation, you know, that their, their children were not learning how to read. Um, and it touched me because, you know, reading... I, I like to tell people, and it's true, reading, I believe, saved my life. You know, it changed my life. I, I, I grew up in a home, in an unsafe home, um, and, and laying in bed in my room reading books really liberated me from whatever else was happening in that home. It offered me an escape, you know, a sense of safety. And, um, and it wasn't just at home, but in school, reading was a safety valve because as I was suffering in silence with my learning disability, you know, cracking jokes and and acting out, I often found myself at the trouble table Um, and the trouble table. And this was third grade and the trouble table in that classroom 
was where you had to go and sit and read quietly while the teacher uh, taught the rest of the class. And sitting there, losing myself in those books, I think really saved my self-esteem and, and, and just all my sense of self. I, I, I found friends in those books and I found acceptance and I found adventure and all of the wonderful things. Um, but it was sitting at that table uh, that I also, well, didn't meet, but I, I, would, I would sit with my friend George, um, who was the other kid that was always in trouble. And, uh, and George didn't know how to read. And so he would sit for a bit and then he'd get up and he'd disrupt the class again. And, and of course, then he would get into more trouble. And, um, and George was the first kid that I met who told me he couldn't read. It was the first experience that I had with, you know, this thing that I, I just do and, and he can't. Um, and it wasn't lost on me, you know, our different outcomes, because even though I struggled through high school, I did go off to college and I started to get help for my learning difference there, uh, went on to graduate law school with honors. Um, and meanwhile, George dropped out in the ninth grade. And so, so when literacy bubbled up on my radar again, now as an education reporter, it was already near and dear to my heart. And I really just wanted to throw myself into that. Um, and, and what that meant was at that time, one of the greatest joys of, of my job is, is that I get to go into schools, you know, and I get to sit in classrooms and I get to watch the magic between teacher and student. And so that's what I was doing. And, and I had this pivotal experience where I visited one school and it's a wonderful school with the principal. Um, I'm very careful to, to say this because, you know, these were wonderful and, and, and just really, um, highly qualified people that, that I was visiting with. And this was a principal who was deservedly named a finalist for state principal of the year. And um, uh, she was so excited to tell me about this new literacy uh, curriculum that they had purchased. And, um, and, and she wanted me to sit in a classroom and watch teacher use this curriculum. And this teacher, by the way, was also a finalist for state teacher of year, deservedly. Um, but they had just adopted a new curriculum by Lucy Calkins. And that name didn't mean anything to me at that time. This is, you know, early in 2019. Uh, but they insisted that I watch one of the teachers conduct a lesson. And so I did. Um, and, and it was honestly captivating. You know, she projected a book onto the screen uh, in the classroom. And I, I watched them walk the book, you know, and they would hypothesize what was happening based on the pictures. Um, and then they went back and they started reading and she started to cue them. Um, and I'm telling you, Laura, the teacher was so engaged and so uh, just looked in her joy. Um, and the kids were so engaged. You know, their eyes were all up front. Their hands are up in the air and they're shouting responses. Um, and afterward, you know, you know, they would, they would talk to me about, I guess, I'm trying to remember the teacher, there was three or four teachers and they were between kindergarten and second grade. And they were telling me more about this curriculum units of study. And I walked away feeling hopeful for all of the parents, you know, that I was talking to who were worried about their kids. I thought maybe this is a solution. And I even underlined units of study three times in my notebook. And a few days later, I was meeting with a, uh, another parent and I told her what what I'd seen and how exciting it was. And, um, and she just looked at me and she says, you know, have you heard of the science of reading? And I had not. And so she sent me a link to Emily Hanford's work. And this was about six months after Hard Words came out and I listened and it was crushing um, because I was so inspired by the lesson I had just seen. And then now I'm hearing everything that Emily laid bare in her audio documentary. Um, and, and that's what sent me initially on the journey with the research, you know, with the Castle Rassel Nation and uh, Mark Seidenberg's book. And honestly, if you look at the guest list of everyone who's been on your show, that's who I was reading. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I, but I was just so shocked. I remember being shocked and I'm sure you hear this all the time, but just surprised at how much research was out there and that, you know, you know but, but people still not, you know, a lot of people didn't know about it. Um, and I was, I was struck that it was particularly relevant to 
you know, the, the LD moms, the, the, the moms of students with learning disabilities. Um, but it was also applicable to every parent because the research was applicable to every kid. Um, and so, you know, I, I just going through the research, I learned, right, that teaching reading and compatibility with the way the brain learns uh, is possible and that it can transform lives. And um, at that point, the story for me became a question. And that question was, is North Carolina teaching reading effectively? And as I started to investigate that question, um, most of the classrooms that I visited were using cueing techniques and, and they were using curricula that, that marketed itself as balanced literacy. Um, but I would also run into teachers who would talk to me about the science of reading and, and, and who were on the, the journey with the research and practice already. Um, as I met with legislator, legislators, I, I, I met some who were uh, working towards grounding instruction in the science of reading, right? Some, but not all. And that was the same story at the State Board of Education, some, but not all. And it was the story among leadership at our Department of Public Instruction. It was under a previous administration. And at that time, there were actually, there were actually six different plans for reading instruction that were floating around that building. And so, it, I mean, just incredible. And so the story just felt very complicated and very difficult for me. Um, not only is it difficult to, you know, explain the research, I'm a neophyte, I'm not, you know, I'm not an academic and this is not my field. Explaining the research felt complicated, but also explaining the political landscape uh, felt very complicated. And so I stayed stuck for, for weeks and, and, really was, you know, uh, was leaning towards maybe just not doing this story. I, I just thought maybe I'm not qualified. Maybe this is not the right time. Um, and meantime, I was chosen as a fellow for, um, for a program with the Education Writers Association. And I ended up in a hotel ballroom with the other fellows. And we were waiting for a group of mentors uh, to, to, to walk in. And lo and behold, as they do, in walks Emily Hanford. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I must have scared her. I must have scared Emily because I, I just ran up to her and I just verbally vomited all of these things that I was seeing in North Carolina and all of these thoughts that I'm having and that I'm struggling with. And it was incredible. And Emily just, you know, she talked me through it and she gave me a lot of advice and she remained a mentor and has become a friend. Um, but she helped me to understand that this issue was just too big to handle in one story, right? My first story, the one that I would say is maybe the most compelling uh, was called The Wall of Sound. And it was a treatise. I mean, it was, it was more words than my editor. My editor told me to, to cut it to 3000 words. Okay, your story should not be at 3000, but he asked me to cut it to 3000. And I think I turned it in at 5000. Um, it was far too long. Uh, but as Emily prophesied, it, it you know, even that was not long enough to tell the full story. And so there were dozens of, um, you know, follow-ups that published before I started seeing broad distribution and interest. Um, and, you know, I'm still, still on the story because there's more to report. Well, and you're, I think what you're, what you're sharing too is that you're, you're untangling that very, very tangled rope that makes up reading, makes up instruction. Like there's so many factors, you, you know, should you, should you come at it from the parents' point of view, from the children, from the teachers, from legislation, from uh, dyslexia, from policymakers, from politicians. I mean, there's all these different strands that make it a pretty tangled rope. And what you're doing is you're unwrapping those strands for us. And I've, and I will connect the show in the show notes, I will connect people to your work so they can see you know, the many different facets you've taken in your storytelling to help really make sense of all of this. Um, and, you know, I, I go back to something you said when we first started talking about this. You said, I almost didn't go down this path. But, you know, Rupin, you were led to it. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. You were led to it. I, I believe that. I mean, I believe that. I look at my at my background and, you know, there's things that stick with you. And, um and there's a reason that those experiences with reading and the experiences with George is a reason that they never left me. 
um, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I do believe I was led there. You know, um, Emily has taken a, a very national point of view on this, and, and you're working, you know, really focused in North Carolina. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked her, but I want you to think about this in terms of North Carolina. How far have has North Carolina come in terms of dealing with literacy and equity issues in education, and what is left to do? Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I, I'll say, you know, at the outset that I believe literacy is an equity issue, right? They're one and the same. I do believe that. Um, nevertheless, as I'm answering from the North Carolina point of view, I'll, I kind of want to touch on them separately uh, for a reason. And so on the literacy front, I think that we're headed in a good direction. Um, but really, we haven't done we haven't done anything yet. I mean, we've, <laughs> if you're involved in education then the measure of your success has to correlate with student success, right? And at this point, we've only just passed a law, right? And we're in the midst of implementation of the law, but, but how we implement it matters a great deal, right? How, how, how we implement it is gonna uh, determine uh, student outcomes. And so are we going to implement it with fidelity to the science, to the research, or will it become about programs that market themselves as science of reading and whatever that might mean? Uh, and, and so far in my interviews and observations from, you know, the classroom level to leadership at, at the Department of Public Instruction, which is driving implementation, I, I feel really good about the direction North Carolina is headed down. And I have high hopes. Um, but it is going to take time. There's a lot left to do. There's, there's, and there's a lot of reasons that it, it takes time. I mean, from my reporting, most of the teachers that I visited with in classrooms tell me that they weren't taught any particular way of teaching reading when they were in ed prep, um, let alone being taught how the brain learns to read. And what that means, uh, you know, for, for, for how they should I, 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 what it means is that they're, they're building the plane while they're flying it, right? They weren't taught anyway. And, and so now they're trying to gain that knowledge while they're already in classrooms teaching kids. And so as, as part of the law uh, that the state passed, every elementary teacher in traditional public schools is going to do letters training. Um, and that has started. The first of three cohorts has, has begun. Um, but, it, but, you know, it's just begun. So they're somewhere in the first couple of units of the eight unit program. It's the two year, um, the, the two year professional development. And then you have a majority of districts which have not started yet. Um, and so when I visit classrooms now, I'm still seeing whole language practices, right? In classrooms. Um, but what do we expect, right? I mean, I think we're, we're retraining teachers now and, and it just, it takes time and, um, I think that we have to give a little bit of grace to, to teachers who didn't know better. Um, and I say that knowing full well how high the stakes are for kids who are, who are not getting their best shot at learning to read. Um, but it's just, it's a reality and well, it's a frustrating is, reality. It, this, it is frustrating. And it's also, it's, um, it, this is ha it's a hard situation because teachers say over and over and over and many times in tears, I didn't know this. Why didn't I learn this in my teacher prep program? So like you said, they're trying to, you know, build the plane while they're flying it. In the meantime, you know, we're trying to provide this, this intensive in-service professional development that is very deep and dense knowledge and, and asking them to translate that into classroom practices, sometimes in places where they're not given materials which allow them to enact what they've learned and then we're also trying to say, okay, well then how do we prevent this by improving teacher prep? So more teachers come out of teacher prep saying, I understand what is necessary to build those neural connections. And all of this, all of this requires a reckoning, like you said, um, that we have to understand that, that we're judged by student success. You know, I always go back, I go back to what Anita Archer said, where she said so many wise things, but one of the things she says, if they haven't learned it, you haven't taught it. Yes, right, right. So that's so that so that kind of reckoning, right? And then the okay, what do I do next? And then how do we, from a systems level, 
prevent teachers from saying, I didn't know this. You know, <laughs> this is information I needed to know. I will tell you that that's one of the reasons that I'm feeling um, hopeful in North Carolina is we are taking a systems, you know, approach to this. And so I, I think that the, the, the most difficult thing right now is having teachers going through letters while they're, you know, in classrooms teaching a current set of students. Um, but while that's happening, we do have movement at, at the ed prep level as well. And so, you know, the UNC system has done a lot of work um, to, to, to create a literacy framework that is going to guide all of the UNC system ed prep programs on how they teach future teachers, right, on, on, on how to instruct in reading. Um, and it's not just the UNC system, the, the independent and private uh, colleges and universities are, are, um, are doing, you know, they have a similar task force and putting together a similar effort. And, you know, one of our uh, uh, private institutions, Lenore Ryan University, has an incredible program that dates back three or four years. You know, Monica Campbell is uh, uh, the dean over there. Well, she's not the dean. She's a, she's a dean. I don't know. I'd have to, but she's in charge of their literacy program. And, and she's just done an incredible job um, putting together uh, a, a licensure program for those students. And so the hardest part is retraining teachers that are already in the rooms, right, in the, in the classrooms. But we do have something happening that's going to um, help teachers that are coming out of ed prep. Yeah, it's, 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 it's both and. It's not either or, it's both and. It has to be. And it's really, Laura, I would say it's both and and. Because in addition to retraining the in-service teachers, we have to support them. And so, and this is, you know, just going off of something you were just saying a moment ago, we've got to give them like real time face-to-face -face coaching. We need coaches in the school buildings who are observing as teachers are trying to put this into practice and then sitting productively with teachers and saying, you know, this is, you know, or even modeling at times. But at this point, I don't know what North Carolina's plan is around school-based coaching. And to be completely honest with you, that's concerning for me because I don't know how successful we'll be without that. And so a lot of my reporting right now is around that. I, I think that that is, um, we're asking a lot of teachers. And if we're gonna ask this much with stakes this high, then we had better support them. Yeah, I agree with you. So, is that, so that's what you're working on right now is that kind of bridge to practice is, you know, here our teachers are learning this, but then how are we bridging that to practice? Right. Okay. Right. So let me ask you a couple other things. Um, number one, how important is legislation in your in your reporting? How important is legislation as a lever of change? And what is happening in North Carolina for the leaders, for principals and administrators and superintendents? Yeah. I, so I think that what I've from what I've seen, you know, legislation. It's a double-edged sword because it can get everybody on the same page through mandate, um, but then it is then it is also a mandate, and so it can feel um, restricting. And so when I look at North Carolina, we uh, we, we mandate letters training for all teachers for all elementary teachers, and um, but there are some districts that have already been through letters, right? And and so I I, I hear some tell me. You know, we wish there was a little bit more flexibility in that. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I think that 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 when when it's when legislated le legislation passes, there there's almost this um, this anxiety and this fear of like compliance, and that can become a superior concern to the actual work of like what's happening between the teacher and the student. So, so all of that to say, I recognize drawbacks. However, you know, in North Carolina, we have 116 school districts and we have 200 plus charter schools and we've got seven lab schools. And without statewide legislation, I don't know how we would have gotten everybody close to the same page. Um, and, and when I tell you that, 
you know, I'm, I visit classrooms and I'm still seeing ineffective reading instruction practices happening, you know, without legislation, I don't know how, how you equitably remedy that because, you know, you'll have districts where students can afford to get outside help. You'll have districts where they have cap leadership capacity and they can look into, um, you know, getting training for themselves and they can look into, um, you know, what their teachers need, giving teacher knowledge, uh, you know, to, to improve instruction. But then you have districts that don't have those resources. And so legislation, I feel like, uh, gives me hope for equitable implementation. Like you said, trying to get us all on the same page. Um, yeah. Do you think, and do you think a, a lever like um, teacher licensure is a is a lever for change for teacher prep? For if teachers have a have to pass a particular licensing exam, for example, do you think that is is help is a motivator for teacher prep to change? So I may be getting a little out of my depth here, but I, I'll just I hesitate to say yes. Um. I, I, I think that I'm doing a lot of reporting right now around high stakes testing and particularly in the K-12 space and, and, and especially in, in, in the early reading grade or the early grades where, where we're, we're, we're doing a lot of assessment around reading. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing studies that show that you can give the same child, you know, different assessments. And one will say proficient, one will say not proficient. And it's like, you know, how reliable are these? Um, I also have concerns around, you know, we're, we're working very hard. Well, there are groups in North Carolina that are working very hard to diversify the teacher workforce. You know, we, we, we have 80% of our teacher workforce is, is white, 20% are educators of color. Right. And students, it's closer to 50 50. Right. So there's a disparity and we're trying very hard um, to diversify this this workforce. But but when you look at some of the, the testing results um, and, and articles and research that I've read, you know, there's questions about the how, how equitable licensure exams are for for um, candidates of color. And so I, I really hesitate to say yes, but. But I also have to say that I really am out of my depth. I mean, a lot of this is is reporting that I'm I'm doing now um, and learning now. I, I know that we need some way to to tell, like whether we're we're like ed prep is effective, whether you know K three teach instruction is effective. We need some levers to be able to measure that. I just wonder if there like can we find better measures? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and that's that's part of this unfolding, right? There are more stories to tell. There's more to unfold. Um, there's more strands to unravel in all of this. And I just have to say, I, I mean, first of all, I could talk to you forever about this, and I, I just so appreciate your time. Um, but I, I, I just so look forward to your continued storytelling around this, Roop, and I think you do a, a masterful job um, in the way that you tell these stories in a way that's very accessible to not only us in the educational community, but um, to, to parents and to other stakeholders. And we're all stakeholders in this, right? We really we're are. All I mean, that's, that's, that's a, uh, it's our students and our, our state and it's our future, right? This is our future. It's all of our, we're all stakeholders. And I try, you know, it really is coming from a, a, a a duty of service, right? And, and really joy in service. Um, and I appreciate your kind words. I, I think that I'm getting better and I think I need to get better because there's a, there's, there's a lot of different stories and there's different audiences for different stories. And, um, and I want to tell as many of them as possible because some need to be accessible by the families, right? By the parents and the grandparents, and 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 others need to be accessible from by policymakers and others from educators, and all of those stories are important, and they're really all coming back to the same thing, which is just you know how important it is that that kids learn to read, and and how it's incumbent upon us to to remedy really what what amounts to a wrong in the past by by not teaching them 
in ways that we know are effective. Right. Well, thank you so much. I just so I look forward to your storytelling around what you've identified as some things you're working on that bridging research to practice for teachers and the high stakes testing issue. I really look forward to that. Yeah. So um, I can't let you go though without asking you a couple of our of our final questions that I ask all of our uh, guests. Okay, let's go. I wa- I I I, I watched the. I watched the podcast on YouTube, and so uh, I'm ready. Well, the first question was about your favorite teacher, but I think that's Mr. Boggs. It's Mr. Boggs. I do need to, I, I got to give a shout out to Miss Willard also, who, who taught me physics my senior year. I was not a great math or science uh, student, and so we're dispelling stereotypes here. I'm, I, my, my family is from India, but I'm not great at math or science. Um, but Miss Woolard was incredible. She just had a great way of connecting with students and um, not just me. A lot of us felt that way. So Mr. Boggs, Mrs. Willard, thank you. Um, okay, what it, what is a favorite book, either as a child or as an adult? So favorite when I was younger was The Grapes of Wrath. Um, and I still love that book and I and, and love the way that Steinbeck writes, um, wrote. Uh, right now, uh, I'm really getting into the Tristan Strong series with my 10 year old who just loves it. Um, and so we're, we're enjoying that right now and, uh, and enjoy Kwame Mbalia, the author who's local, local in North Carolina, lives in Durham. Oh, fantastic. Well, you know, I'll put that in the show notes too. Um, and then you're reading that with your 10 year old, how fun. Um, so, oh, that's what, so that's what, so that's what you're, so that's what you're reading right now. Is there anything else you're reading right now that you want to give a, a shout out for? <laughs> So I brought down what I'm reading right now, and I'll show it to you. It's it's a page turner. It's called Theories of Adolescent Development. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I'm re- it, it is it's incredibly informative, and it's really you know one of the things that I'm hoping to do with my work is just study the role of schools in adolescent development, um, and all of these non academic supports that we can provide kids that will open up, you know, unlock uh, the doors to, to academic achievement. And yeah, that also might come in handy with your emerging adolescent at home. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you have on your desk that symbolizes you or is dear to you? I have, um, I have these three claws. So these, these are claws that I received. Um, I, I, I participate in something called Y Guides. And this is a program through the YMCA. It's a father-son program. And so I started doing it with my oldest when he was six years old and he's 13 now and um, started doing it with my youngest when he turned six and he's 10 now. And um, these claws are from uh, a weekend outing, a camping event that we did together. And it was the first time that all three of us could go together and do that. And um it's just, I'm, I'm so grateful to the YMCA and to that program because I don't know, like I, I it's just incredible bonding with my kids in that time is. Yeah, I want to put that in the show notes. Is it wide eyes? It's wide, letter Y, uh, guides. Y guys, got it. Okay, I'm going to put that in the show notes. I don't know anything about that. So I'll have to figure, I'll have to put some more work into that. Okay, um, and what are your greatest hopes for today's children? And I think you've expressed that many times throughout the, throughout the podcast, but if you could just maybe just and summarize it for us. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it's all of what we talk about, but really more than anything, it's that we do no harm. I hope every child feels a sense of belonging and love, right? Of course, I want them to master competencies and learn to read and have bright careers and whatever they choose to do. But so much more than that, I just want them to attend school in places that love on them constantly and, and, and do no harm. I love that very much. And I think that's a wonderful way for us to wrap up our conversation today. I've been, I've been quite moved by this conversation, Rupin. Thank you. And um, thankful, thank you for the gentle way that you are shaping the world. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the Reading League. And thank you to you, Laura. I really appreciate it. I've, I've, I've enjoyed meeting you, you know, when you came down to North Carolina, but I've also just really enjoyed this podcast. Um, and just all of the resources, it helps me is, you know, to, to, 
to understand <laughs> a lot of what I'm reading um, because it is way over my head and um, but I need to understand it so I can tell it better. And, and a lot of that is thanks to you all. We're all on that journey, aren't we? <laughs> well, thank you again. I'm so appreciative, so grateful. Um, thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I loved hearing about Rupin's background and what has started him on this road to journalism and specifically to writing about literacy and education. And I think it's wonderful just to kind of see the through line of how he began and where he is now. And I just so look forward to what he has in store next for us. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, you know, please let us know, please rate us, and also please provide us with feedback. We want to make sure that we're offering great stories like this to you um, and wonderful guests like Rupin. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being part of our community. And we'll see you next time.